Good evening, see the CDA. I want to thank my good friend and my brother Rustin Seaman for those kind words of introduction. He introduced me with such flattering terms. I can't wait to hear what I have to say. Uh, but I want to make one correction. He talked about me, used to be a fine athlete. I still have game. I don't know about him. But I'm certainly grateful to be here, and I'm, I'm really grateful to uh, Brother Noah Castellanos and the CCDA board for entrusting me with the sacred uh, platform of, of CCDA for, for these moments this evening, and Brother Dave Clark for all his kind and generous support and help, and also to Dr. John Perkins and Mother Vera Mae Perkins, who've been a tremendous inspiration to me. And I started reading Dr. Perkins' books over 30 years ago, about the same time that Rustin Seaman started to read the books as well. And I've been tremendously inspired, motivated, and challenged to try to be a better pastor, a better Christian, and a better Christian uh, community uh, developer. I'm reminded of my granddaughter. I'm the proud grandfather of five beautiful grandchildren. And I made a great sacrifice today. Thank you. I made a great sacrifice today to not go home because today uh, one of my granddaughters was celebrating her second uh, birthday. So we had a big party, and I was just talking to them a few moments ago. But in front of my, my oldest granddaughter, I wanted to teach her how to tell time. And so I didn't want her to learn to tell time using a digital clock. So I got an old clock and took the face off of it, and I was showing her when the little hand is here and the big hand is here, this is how you tell what time it is. And she was about five or six years old, and she said, okay, oh, Paul, Paul, I've, I got it, I've got it. And so after church one Sunday, I was taking her and my grandson out, and she said, Paul, Paul, when you started preaching, the little hand was between the 11 and the 12. And by the time you finished, the big hand had went all the way around. She said, Papa, that was too long. She said, you should have stopped when the big hand got about halfway. That's long enough. And so I have about 15 minutes tonight, and I think that's plenty of time to share a good message and far too much time to share a bad one. I'm a pastor. I was born and raised in the rural coal fields of southern West Virginia to a single mother and a matriarchal grandmother. They raised my seven brothers and sisters and us to have high hopes and have high expectations to believe that tomorrow could be better than the day we put the Lord first and we did our very best. And for the last 25 years, I've had the privilege of discharging the gospel of Jesus Christ in the inner city of Charleston, West Virginia. For 16 years at one church, the Grace Bible Church, right in the heart of the west side of Charleston, the toughest neighborhood in our state. I normally do more funerals each year than I do weddings for young people in our community. And some years ago, I started really just praying and asking the Lord, Lord, what's happening to our city and what has happened to cities all over America? And so I've been on this, this pilgrimage to try to share with Christians all over the country that we have a crisis. And we must wake up to this crisis, not going to self-correct. And it's going to require us to, to discharge some different strategies and philosophies if we're going to make a difference to turn our communities around, particularly reaching our young people. And I want to talk tonight about the, the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ as it is contained in the Great Commission, a passage that all of you are familiar with. As our Lord instructs his disciples and instructs us to go into all the world and to make disciples, and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to identify them with God in his Trinitarian fullness, and that he would be with us even until the end of the age. And I concluded that I did not really understand the Great Commission. And I also concluded much of the Christian church today does not, do not have a full and complete understanding of the Great Commission. And I want to share some few thoughts about that tonight. But first, I want to talk about this crisis that exists in the United States of America, and it manifests itself in our prison population, our prison system. The prison system is an indicator of the failures of a society. No mother goes to death's door to give birth to a child to see them grow up and go to prison. So anytime anyone goes to prison, it's been a colossal failure. The individual has failed to take advantage of the opportunities that was presented to them. The parents may have failed in some way to really bring their children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. The public school possibly failed in its charge to teach and instruct and help indoctrinate children with the educational skills they would need to be competitive in the economy. 
The social welfare system has often failed to provide the necessary support and encouragement that children need to be successful and to not fall through the gap of our society. There's been failures all along the way. And we have 2.3 million people in this country in our prison system. One out of every 100 Americans are in prison. One out of 10 African American men are in prison. One out of four African American men are under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. It's a major, major crisis. And it's manifested itself in the growth of our prison population. Today, over 130,000 juveniles are incarcerated in juvenile detention and correctional facilities around this country, 130,000. Two million children are arrested every year in the United States. There are 500,000 children in the foster care system in this country. That is the crisis. And if we don't do something about it, we will bankrupt ourselves trying to build prisons and to fill these prisons. So the crisis manifests itself in our prison industrial complex. But it goes further than that. There's a cause to this, and the cause is the catastrophic breakdown of the fundamental basic building blocks of our society. The first one, of course, is the family. You know the statistics. 70% of all African-American children are born out of wedlock. 50% of all Latino children are born out of wedlock. 35% of all Caucasian children are born out of wedlock. And what's happening in the African-American community is a historical anomaly. In 1960, 75 to 80% of all African-American children were born in a two-parent household, 1960. I'm an amateur historian, and I can't find nowhere in history where you have, we have witnessed the catastrophic breakdown of the family that we've experienced over the last 50 years in the African-American community. You have to look at a time when foreign invaders have came into a nation to cripple it by killing the men and taking others off hostage. The cause, the breakdown of the family. But not only is the breakdown of the family, we also have a breakdown in the community. The community has broken down. You no longer have the extended family. You no longer have the nieces and nephews and aunts and all the extended family to provide support for families in neighborhoods. So communities are fall down, falling apart. The breakdown of community. But not only is it the breakdown of the family and the breakdown of the community, but the breakdown of the educational system. The public school used to be sort of an extension of community. So now in our poor communities, our schools are in shambles, unable to effectively educate our children and equip them with the skills they need to function in this complex, highly technical society. Breakdown of family, breakdown of the community, breakdown of the educational system. But the fourth pillar is also severely damaged and that's the church. The church no longer has the statue or the influence that it has historically had in the lives of children. David Olson out of Chicago, in his research, his data gathering, estimates that less than 18% of Americans go to church on any given Sunday morning. That's why there is no traffic jams on any highway in America on Sunday morning and a lower percentage of that than children are going to church. We, we've got a problem. Children are no longer under the influence of the Judeo-Christian ethic. They have no spiritual historical memory. People my age left church. My children, people, children my age never got to the church. And so the children today have no historical memory of the church. The breakdown, a cataclysmic breakdown of societal fundamental structures. And so the church has never had an effective strategy for evangelism because we've always depended upon parents to bring their children to church. And so we have this captive audience, but that's no longer the case. There are more children outside of the influence of the church ever at any point in time in the history of this great republic. So when you see the breakdown of these fundamental pillars, it leads to a crisis, and it manifests itself in the group that has the least moral and spiritual resistance, like any physical pathology, and that's the children. And so we, now we see children in serious, serious trouble. Just go to a public school, and I call public schools in our community the Social Pathological Diagnostic Centers. It makes me sound pretty intelligent, I thought. 
But that's where we diagnose what's wrong because it's the first time that someone is paying close attention to some children. So now we find out that they can't sit down, they can't concentrate, they can't count, they don't know their address. So now we find the label for them, educated mental retarded, behavior disorder, learning disability, attention deficit disorder. We label them, we start medicating them to control their behavior so that we can keep them seated and still in school long enough to try to teach them. And then they become junior high and they figure out the game we're playing on them. They stop taking their medication, they stop medicating themselves with marijuana and alcohol. Now we've got a serious problem on our hands. And so that we see this problem manifesting itself. So we have a serious problem. The systems are broken. Children live in systems. We all live in systems. We develop the maturity and the sophistication to navigate ourselves in and out of the various systems. But children live in system, a family system, an educational system, hopefully a church system, an economic system, a political system. And then some of our children end up in oppressive systems, like the social welfare, foster care system, or the juvenile justice system. I've learned from my good friend, Lowell Noble, a term, systems of oppression. And there are systems that oppress children once they get in the system. And the juvenile justice system is one such system of oppression. It is closed to the public. There's no input, a very little input from the public. And so children basically are processed through this system and many mature and maturate into the adult criminal industrial complex. Now, what is the solution? I'm glad y'all asked the question. Because inquiring minds want to know, and prophets must be truth tellers, but they also must articulate and postulate some, some solutions. The solutions is the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ and really understanding the depth of the Great Commission. Understanding the depth and the scope of the Great Commission. We view the Great Commission only from the mandate of worldwide conquests. So we're ready to go to Africa and go to Asia and go to these remote places where Jesus Christ has not been preached. And that's an accurate interpretation. But we must not only listen to what Jesus said, we must watch what did he do. He didn't go anywhere very far. He did not leave Israel. Spent much of his adult earthly ministry in Hicksville, Nazareth of Galilee. Made the sojourn south to Jerusalem, the capital. He didn't cover much geographical territory. But when you look at what he did, you see the genius of Jesus of Nazareth, and you see the key to evangelism in the 21st century in America. It was a ministry of penetration. It's not only go all over the world, but go into the world. In John, he says, as the Father sent me into the world, so send I you into the world. Now, Jesus didn't come here and just go on a sightseeing tour. He literally came into the world. He felt the pain and the heartache and the diff and the tough places. You can see the depth of his ministry when you look at the people that he called to be close to him. He calls Matthew, who was a publican. He worked for the IRS. And he calls him and commissions him to be an apostle. And what does Matthew do? Matthew throws a big party, and who does he invite? All of his fellow publicans, tax collectors, and sinners who were members of the IRS to create an evangelistic opportunity for Christ, and some of them came to Christ. So he penetrates the IRS system of the day. He calls Peter, James, and John. They were professional fishermen. So Jesus is now, he's penetrating one of the major commercial enterprises of the day, the fish commerce. So he has disciples from that sphere. He goes a little bit further than that. The first miracle that he performs is in Cana of Galilee. That was a social function. He was always been invited to parties. So he penetrates the social life of Israel. In John chapter 3, he gets a meeting with a midnight rabbi by the name of Nicodemus, who was one of the preeminent theologians of the day, one of the top teachers of the law. So Jesus evangelizes him, and now he has someone within the hierarchy and the higher echelon of Jewish life. You see his strategy? But he goes further than that. He has in his band of disciples a guy by the name of Simon. Simon who was one of those who were part of the insurrection group, who were trying to overthrow the Roman government. He had a gangbanger. He penetrates the gangs. 
of Israel. And he wins Simon the Zealot. I'm not exaggerating. And so he wins Simon the Zealot. The reason these guys fussed and argued so much is because they all had huge egos because they were used to running the show. He brings this eclectic group together to be with him for three and a half years to pour his life into them. You see a little bit more about the genius of Jesus of Nazareth in his death and in his burial party. Who shows up to get the body? Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy, powerful man. Who shows up to properly bury the body? The women. He had penetrated the domestic life of Israel. The women financed his ministry. Every preacher knows it takes three books to run a ministry. The Bible, the good book, the song book, and the pocketbook, and the women got the pocketbooks. And so the women were financing his ministry. What I'm trying to get you to see as I close as he penetrated every single sphere of life. So at his resurrection, he already had disciples strategically uh, positioned and located within all the spheres of influence in Jewish life. So when the Holy Spirit comes and empowers them, they're now capable of evangelizing their sphere of influence. Where's my amen corner? Amen. Every good Baptist preacher needs an amen corner. Well, here's what we need to do, and here's what I'm postulating that America needs to do. We gotta understand the Great Commission, the mandate to penetrate. That's why Matthew 5, he says, you are the salt of the earth. Salt penetrates. Salt retards putrefaction and decay by penetration, and we influence by penetration. So here's what we have to do. Here's what we have to do. We got to go back to our respective neighborhoods and communities and we got to gather together all of those who are concerned about the young people in our community. And we must develop a strategy as how we're going to penetrate these spheres that have the control of the children. So the number one sphere is the public school system. They do us a great favor. They gather the kids together every day for us. And we have to figure out a way how we can penetrate that by going in, doing tutoring and mentoring, mobilizing the senior citizens who have time and availability and other professionals who can go in and do tutoring and mentoring and build relationships with children. Use those relationships as a bridge to their parents and the bridge becomes the platform on which the gospel is shared. Penetrate the school system, after school programs. And there's another area we have to penetrate. It's the midget league and bitty league sports complex. That's not sports, that's a religion. Sports has become a religion. If you don't believe me, go into any town on Sunday morning, I guarantee they're playing football, basketball, or soccer. They're doing something athletically. But very often the people running these programs are not the Christian people. We, got, we must penetrate those systems. We must penetrate those systems. We got to win the hearts of our children by penetrating the system, the school system, the Bill league sports complex system, and then we need the elite guard, the special forces, who will then decide we're gonna penetrate the social welfare system, those who run the foster care system, and those who run the juvenile justice system. Now let me tell you why we have to do this. If we don't do this, we're in trouble. We're headed down a slippery slope toward chaos and confusion. I'm a community developer. We do housing, workforce development, job training, everything you can think of. But at the end of the day, the children in my neighborhood who make the most noise, who cause the most racket, they can tear things down fast and I can build things up. And you, you mothers know that. You can clean the house up and they can tear it down in five minutes. We've got to engage them. We got to engage them. And we got to engage them by penetrating to win their hearts so that we have credibility with them. Well, I'm going to close because I'm out of my time. But I want to close with this. My life was changed on September 11, 2001. God spoke to me powerful, powerfully, and I could not I ignore the pull of the Spirit of God. After watching the twin towers topple to the ground, and I heard this man's name, Osama bin Laden. I'd heard the name before, but like most other Americans, I had not paid attention. But I started paying attention. And what I understood and began to understand, that he and I had a lot in common. He was a civil engineer, just like me. A man of religious 
passion and zeal and commitment, hopefully just like me. But he took all of his resources, his technology, his financial resources, goes in this poor country of Afghanistan, and he invests himself into this country, and he wins the heart of children. And he teaches them his fanatical brand of Islam, to hate us and to despise the West. And God spoke to my heart. He said, you don't have Bin Laden's commitment. You don't have his commitment. You're not as committed to me and to the gospel and to reaching children and discipling them as Bin Laden is. And until you match that commitment, we cannot move the United States of America. That's what it's going to take. All the research tells us what we need to do. We just ignore the research. George Bonner wrote a whole book about it, How to Build Spiritual Champions. And in that book, Bonner confessed, I've been ignoring children far too much. And we need to focus more attention on serious, strategic, comprehensive, holistic evangelism discipleship of children. They have what's called the 5 to 12 window. You ever heard of that? 5 to 12 window. All of the researchers who do child evangelism research, 5 to 12. It is the most probable time a person will come to Christ. 32% probability between 5 to 12. 4% probability between 13 and 19, and 6% probability after that. That's what the researcher says. Well, as I close here, I'm reminded of a scripture in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And after the fall, and God comes to the garden to pronounce judgment. And God pronounces judgment upon the serpent. And he says that the seed, there will be enmity or hostility between the serpent and the seed of the woman. And the serpent would bruise his heel, but the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. Now we know that that was the first prophetic utterance of the virgin birth of Christ. But let me tell you the profound point there. In that passage, God speaking to, serpent, to the serpent, also Adam and Eve's eavesdrop, and they understand that their salvation... Their deliverance is going to come through their children. So when Eve has her first child, Cain, she says, I received the man of the Lord. But Cain was of the wicked one. He killed his brother Abel. And she conceived Seth and says, I receive another man of the Lord. And so the hope of Israel, they believe, would come through their seed. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that the hope of the United States of America is our children. The hope of our community is our children. The hope of turning things around is our children because at the end of the day, if we build and we ne neglect them, we will spend all of our money trying to keep them out of jail. We'll spend all of our money raising the children that their boyfriends have left behind on their way to prison or to the graveyard. We'll squander away all of our resources if we don't focus on our children. When I was a boy, there was a TV show that came on. It was The Six Million Dollar Man. Lee Major. Y'all remember the Six Million Dollar Man? Matter of fact, he's peddling something now on TV. But anyway, the, the show would come on and you'd hear this ominous voice. There's been a terrible accident. He's been seriously injured. And then another voice says, but we can rebuild him. And we can make him stronger and faster than he's ever been before. Well, I believe that we can rebuild our communities starting with our children, and we can make them stronger and faster and more spiritual than what they've ever been before. And we can raise up a seed that will honor the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. and that will continue the work that we have set our hands to and that we can pass the work on to. God bless you. I'm out of my time, and I thank you for yours. <laughs>